Yes, you have the same handout as two weeks ago, and we'll be continuing on in this look at uh, Isaiah chapter 33. Two weeks ago, we covered the first two points on the front page there. Nations and individuals reap what they sow, and we talked about um, many types of sowing and reaping and some of the images, the most striking ones on the sheet are related to that theme and the uh, judgment of God upon those that are reaping uh, the evil uh, coming back upon them. So to the wind and weep, reap the whirlwind. And then as if very important for our time and history, we covered the point, pray for the Lord to deliver you and your nation. And on the uh, almost the couple days of uh, waiting for our national elections, uh, let's continue praying for God to heal our nation. And we know the requirements of believers and that formula for God healing. My people called by my name, humble themselves and pray. Uh, and so it's not just for the purpose of healing our nation. God wants us to walk humbly before him and to pray and confess our sins and all of those things are a part and parcel with the regular Christian life. And if believers would be salt and light in all of the communities where they're at, uh, God does some amazing things through uh, his, uh, the ambassadors of Jesus Christ to all the world, wherever they the believers are at. So let's begin today with the exalting the Lord and filling our appeals with praise and learning this from the example of Isaiah chapter 33. If you uh, flip over to the back side, we'll begin. Mid page there with point three Judah appeals to and praises Jehovah for his attributes. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds now to receive your word. I pray that we would be able to think your thoughts as they're recorded here. And Holy Spirit, that you would make the application of your word to our hearts uh, in um, pushing us and leading us and encouraging us and challenging us to um, take and receive these words of life re as recorded in your holy word. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So back in verse two, just the first part of the verse, Israel prays, O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. That was the case back then. It's still the case with believing Israel today. Uh, they are waiting. The Orthodox Jew is waiting for their promised Messiah, and they don't realize that they missed him when he came. And uh, one day they will realize, as every knee will. Uh, bow before the Lord Jesus and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And then verses 5 and 6, we read, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness, wisdom and and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. Just praise to God for these 
incredible attributes that he demonstrates to uh, mankind. He demonstrates it to the heavenly host and his justice and righteousness, wisdom, knowledge, his and strength of salvation fills the universe as a praise to him. Uh, let our continued uh, worship of him and our corporate sense each Sunday and our personal devotions with him in the mornings and throughout the day and the evening times and the meditations of our heart at night just be drawn to exalting our great God. The end of verse 6 identifies a real treasure for us, a literal treasure. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. And if you open that treasure chest over on the side, uh, you'll see in it a series of verses just below the chest there that all identify this, the ways in which the fear of the Lord are valuable. Valuable in many, many categories. From the Psalms, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. From the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. From the book of Job, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. And back to the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, and the fear of the Lord prolongs days, and the fear of the Lord in that fear, there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. What are the treasures of the fear of the Lord? Just go to the underlined words in those verses. Wisdom, knowledge, instruction, wisdom, understanding, hating evil, prolonging days, strong confidence, and a place of refuge refuge. I pray that each of us would uh, move more and more into these types of treasures um, versus the earthly treasures that capture our attention and uh, seek to have our, our uh, hearts seeking after. Number four, Jehovah answers Judah's prayers and gives notice to sinners in verses 10 through 14. We'll not spend much time on this, but Assyria, which is the topic of this section of Isaiah, is getting what it deserves because vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And uh, while he used Assyria to chastise his chosen people, Israel, uh, he also is going to give them the consequence of their uh, sin and wickedness. It's, uh, it was an amazing thing to see how God handles these types of situations. So reading in verse 10, now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift up myself. You, sh uh, you shall conceive chaff. And here it's the judgment upon the Assyrians. And in God's judgment of them, he himself is being exalted as he now executes his judgment upon them. You shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you, and the people shall be like the burnings of lime. Like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Hear you who are afar off what I have done, and you who are near, acknowledge my might. It's a fearful thing to 
fall into the hands of the living God. And then number five, the conclusion of our chapter here, Jehovah God reveals who it is that will dwell on high with him. It's a fascinating description that Isaiah records here. Uh, Daniel read from uh, King David in Psalm 15 uh, about the same theme. And David wrote and recorded that psalm uh, long before Isaiah wrote his description of the same uh, scenario of who will dwell with the Lord on high. Let's just read from Isaiah here. Verses 15 and 16. Who will dwell on high with the Lord? And that expression was back in verse 5. The Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. So who is among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Now that's the, the judgment side of everlasting punishment. But on the everlasting side of dwelling with the Lord is he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes. In other words, turning away that, those temptations. Who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil, he will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. As always in these chapters, mingled with such judgments, prophecies of judgment, of wickedness, and uh, warnings to the um, to Israel to repent and get right with God, there's always these tremendously encouraging sections that have application not to just believing Israel, but to believers in any generation and to us. Flip back to the front page and let's look a little bit more of the description. So we saw... Isaiah's answer here, and that's on the, the bottom center box of your notes. Isaiah's answer to the question, who will dwell on high with the Lord? And I just broke it up into segments there. Isaiah's answer to that question is the one that walks righteously. And we know from the book of Romans that there... And from Isaiah, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so the only righteousness that we can claim, the only righteousness that there is, is the righteousness of God. And it's ours in Jesus Christ. And so with his righteousness upon us, we can walk righteously. And then speaks uprightly. Again, from the New Testament, Paul writes, this is the person that speaks the truth with his neighbor. Speaks the truth in love, but speaks the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Isaiah says, this person despises the gain of oppressions. And that is, does not oppress the poor to gain wealth. This person gestures with his hands, refusing bribes. Does not pervert justice by receiving bribes. This person stops his ears of hearing of bloodshed. And that is the idea of making no plans of murder with others. 
This person shuts his eyes from seeing evil. That is, he sets no wicked thing before his eyes. He doesn't intentionally seek out and um, lodge in the place of wicked thoughts and wickedness and what, what is coming into his eye gate. This person will uh, have as defense the fortress of rocks. And blessed be the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. This person, bread will be given him. And we have the privilege of partaking in Jesus as the bread of life. And this person, his water will be sure. And as we drink from the everlasting water that flows from the throne of God through Jesus Christ, uh, it's as Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water and I would give it to you. And so uh, the well never runs dry and it satisfies the sin sick soul and heals them. Now, David, writing a great while before Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in both Psalm 15 and uh, very similarly in Psalm 24, says that this person that dwells on high walks uprightly and works righteousness. You could start drawing some lines across from a Psalm to Isaiah. I did on my sheet here. You can see it there. Maybe not. Um, I guess Isaiah also read the Psalms. But David says that this person speaks the truth in his heart, does not backbite with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, does not take up offenses, despises evil, honors those who fear the Lord, honors commitments, though it costs him, doesn't charge interest to family, can't be bribed to hurt the innocent, resolves to stand firm, has clean hands, has a pure heart, is not idolatrous. And then, we'll not do it here, but if you want to continue this um, imagery, just go to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus also read the Psalms and also read Isaiah and quoted prolifically from both books as well as uh, adding his interpretations of what you have heard from old times. And, but I say unto you, and uh, you'll see many things on this list from both Isaiah and the Psalms that Jesus also refers to in his Sermon on the Mount. Now, how do we practically do these things? Well, first of all, they can't be done in the power of the flesh. Uh, and and our, our uh, misunderstanding intellects and our, our purposing to do things on our own, which is tantamount to pride, uh, you know, we, we feel that we can do things. Um, if you just had this as a grocery list and a checklist, so how am I going to up, walk uprightly? Apart from enrolling in basic training, you know, where you straighten up your back and stand up tall and... Um, but that's a perfect image of what it means to walk uprightly. You, you're, there's a strength to uprightness. There's a virtue in standing upright. And it, it's not only physically virtuous, 
but spiritually, mentally, emotionally to, to stand up, to uh, be erect um, and not uh, hunched over and sickly and all of the things that go with um, the indication of a person that is upright. If you look into the deep meaning of the word, Hebrew word, it just means upright, <laughs> standing erect. Works righteousness. Well, we know it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, um, that we are saved, but God has saved us to do good works of righteousness. He has prepared us ahead of time for doing good works. So before men, that they may see those good works, which those of you that have heard me preach in, over the years here, a good work is a God work, okay? Just connect the two. It, it ain't good if it's not from God. Every perfect and good gift comes down from God. And there's none good but God. So good works are God works through us. Well, anyway, you can just go through this list and you can just check off, okay, not in my strength, not in my strength but in the strength of the Lord, in the strength of the Lord. And I think that would be a good homework assignment for each of us to go through the characteristics and the quality that God is going to instill in those that will walk with him on high. Now, in conclusion for the message here, um, over the last three days, I've just been drawn to um, hymns that are on this topic. And at the beginning of the week or the end of the last week, I was communicating with Daniel about the hymns for today. And I said, uh, just the general theme is walking with the Lord on high. You go ahead and pick out the hymns. But from Thursday on, I have eight hymns. <laughs> None of them are what you picked for today. <laughs> but I think it's of the Lord. And uh, what, I, what I would like to do is have a little spontaneous singspiration time here in conclusion to the message. And uh, half of the eight are in the worship and service hymnal. The other half are not. And uh, I have... 10 copies that I made with all eight uh, hymns on it. Sir. So if you can roughly have a representative of uh, nine, because I'll give the 10th to the piano player. Okay. And let's try this. I was so thrilled and encouraged. Somebody else want to parcel these out, Daniel, you, you can choose. <laughs> I'll tell you which ones are in the worship and service. And so, um, now the first one is, I just have the words for it, and I searched high and low in the hymnals that I have. Most of my all of my music library is already packed in boxes for the move over to my office at the triplex versus my office at our lake house, okay? So uh, these were ones I, I could find. And uh, just as an aside while you get ready here, um, these are all different hymnals Three of them represent the decades of my life. I, the first two decades of my life, uh, our church used inspiring hymns. This one. 
And so uh, this was what I grew up with. And the, uh, the hymn that we started with today, Holy, 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 was always the first hymn every Sunday that we sang in the church I grew up in. And it was out of this hymnal. So that's a very precious thing. Then I went away to Bible college and seminary and uh, ministry. And for the next two decades, it was the worship and service hymnal, which we have out in our pews here. And so I'm very familiar with that hymnal. And then uh, the next decade, almost to the year, maybe 11 years, our uh, church home up uh, in the suburbs there, Naperville, used great hymns of the faith. And that's a great hymnal as well. And then uh, we moved down here and back to the worship and service hymnal, as well as other uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual song books, right? <laughs> So, now, this first one, Walking with Jesus, was a chorus that I heard not all that often, but it stuck with me as a child and a teenager. It was uh, published in 1942. I have the music in Syncspiration Volume 3, but that's packed away in boxes, so I didn't have the music. But it goes like this. Walking with Jesus, walking every day, all along the way, for I am walking with Jesus, walking with Jesus alone. One sixty two in the Wilds book. Verse two. Walking in the sunlight, walking in the shadow, walking every day, all along the way for I am walking in the sunlight, walking in the shadow, walking with Jesus alone. Good job. And the theme here is not only dwelling on high with the Lord, but walking with him. That's what both Isaiah and David said in their first point. Walks uprightly, walks righteously. Well, how do they walk and who do they walk with? It's walking with Jesus. Now... The When He Shall Come is the last one that we'll sing. They were both short, and I put them on one sheet of paper. So go to the next higher ground. And I've highlighted on your copies uh, some of the phrases that point to dwelling on high and walking with the Lord here below before we even get there. Higher ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table plan. That's a little too fast for me to pronounce. Okay, slow down a little bit. My heart has no desire to stay Where doubts arise and fears dismay Though some may dwell where these abound My prayer, my aim is higher ground Lord, lift me up and let me stand By faith on heaven Table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, my 
set my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan starts at the hurl. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till have I found, Lord, meet me on to higher ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on was 357 in your hymnal. Sorry about that. All right. It is glory just to walk with him. This is from Great Hymns of the Faith. This is a good one, folks. It is a glory. It is glory just to walk with him whose blood has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul each day. It is joy divine to feel him there. Bless the Lord, it's glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. Guide my steps around through the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with Him. It is glory when the shadows fall to know that He is near. Oh, what joy to simply trust and pray. It is glory to abide in Him when skies above are clear. Yes, it's glory. steps are right through the veil and o'er the height. It is glory just to walk with Him. It will be glory when I walk with Him on heaven's golden shore, never from His side again to stray. It will be glory with the Savior evermore, everlasting glory all the just to walk with Him. It is glory just to walk with Him. He will guide my steps around through the veil and o'er the light. It is glory just to walk with Him. Walk on high with Him. Page uh, or hymn 411 in the worship and service. Uh, stepping in the light. Let's stand so you can practice stepping.
297. And let's do the first verse, third verse, and fifth verse of trust and obey when we walk with the Lord. When we walk with inspiring hymns again in the secret of his presence and the uh, Christian lady that wrote this the words to this uh, was from India and she was born into a wealthy Brahmin home and her mother died when she was just in that first year after her birth and a uh, real Hardships came upon the family through uh, some historic event. I, it slipped me see the name of it right now. But she ended up being adopted uh, by a missionary couple and taken back to England and uh, educated. And, and uh, she went back to India le years later as a missionary to her native country. But she wrote uh, this him, George Stebbins wrote the music, and it encapsulates another aspect of dwelling with the Lord on high. We will be with the Lord forever, and uh, we shall see him and, and uh, know him and walk with him. But we can see him and know him and walk with him now. And I liken it to the psalm which was used in the writing of this hymn. In the secret of his presence is fullness of joy. And it's an aspect of walking on high with him. Let's sing in the secret of his presence. In the secret of his presence, how my soul delights to hide. Oh, how precious are the lessons which I learn at Jesus' side. Earthly cares vex me near their trials, lay me low. For when Satan comes to tempt me, to the secret place I go. To the secret place I go. It's uh, written as a solo and it, a little bit slower on some of the phrases there. So, 
When my soul is faint and thirsty neath the shadow of his wing, there is cool and pleasant shelter and a fresh and crystal spring. And my Savior rests beside me as we hold communion sweet. If I tried, I could not utter what he says when thus we meet, what he says when thus we meet. Only this I know, I tell him all my doubts and and fears. Oh, how patiently he listens, and my drooping soul he cheers. Do you think he never proves me what false friend he would be if he never, never told me of the sins which he must see, of the sins which he must see? Would you like to know the sweetness of the secret of the Lord? Go and hide beneath his shadow, this shall then be your reward. And whene'er you leave the silence of that happy meeting place, you must mind and bear the image of the Master in your face of the master in your face. She got it. Praise the Lord. Now, one that you're more familiar with on the similar theme, and it has imageries, imagery of the Garden of Eden where man created in his innocence walked with God personally and knew him and uh, fellowshiped with him. And one day that will be restored completely in person, walking with him in glorified bodies. But spiritually, it's our place. And so this hymn in the garden, hymn 311 in your hymn, hymn books, uh, is in the garden for over 30 years my family uh, led this hymn, among many others, at a monthly nursing home service up in our suburbs up there in the Chicago area. And this was the very favorite hymn of the elderly folks in the rest home there. And uh, many of them knew Christ as personal Savior. And so they knew the spiritual significance of it. On the side of the meeting room at the nursing home was a garden, it's just an inner courtyard garden. And so it was a fitting imagery of meeting in a place, a solitary place alone with the Lord. And we often used it to talk about a personal walk with Christ in the garden. Let's stand again.
understanding, this one is not in hymnal. Do we have the words for it? Okay, no, that's not it. When he shall come, this is out of the hymnal for worship and celebration, a new hymnal, hymnal for me. I saw it somewhere else, but this was the only one that I had a copy of to make here. And this one is back to the theme of dwelling with the Lord and to fulfill the promise of Revelation 3, 4, which says, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy when he shall come. When he shall come, resplendent in his glory, to take his own from out this veil of night. Oh, may I know the joy at his appearing only at morn to walk with him in white. When I shall stand Within the court of heaven, where white robed pilgrims pass before my sight, earth's martyred saints and blood washed overcomers, these then are they who walk with him. Think of walking some day in white with Jesus. He appeared in dazzling white raiment on the Mount of Transfiguration. He appeared to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos in blazing fire and brightness. He appeared to the Apostle Paul on the day of his conversion, shining brighter than the noonday sun. And so, as we prepare for our communion time, thank the Lord for saving your soul and for calling you to walk with him in white. You can serve yourself in a, a few moments after you've prayed. 